Episode of Progress, Potential, and Possibilities, discussions with fascinating people designing a better tomorrow for all of us. I'm your host, Ira Pastor. Welcome, everybody, again to another episode of our show, bringing you another really fascinating guest today involved in creating uh, a better tomorrow for all of us. Uh, today, we have the honor of being joined by Dr. Melanie Igorin, who is Assistant Secretary for Legislation at the United States Department of Health and Human Services where she has a really unique role uh, at the intersection of uh, the executive and legislative branches of our government with the responsibility for interacting with Congress uh, and responding to, to various congressional oversight requests as it pertains to HHS's role across its its 12 different operating divisions. And, and you know, these are uh, responsible for administering a wide variety of health and human services programs to, to over 100 million people nowadays. Uh, Dr. Gordon has had a 25-year a career in the health policy domain, uh, recently served uh, as Democratic Deputy Staff Director, uh, Subcommittee on Health and the Committee on Ways and Means uh, in the United States House of Representatives. And there she was staff lead for the Affordable Care Act, for Medicare Advantage, uh, dual eligible beneficiaries, women's health, health tax issues. Uh, prior to joining Ways and Means, uh, Dr. Igor and worked for the United States uh, GAO, the Government Accountability Office, uh, as well as at the uh, University of California Office of the President. Uh, she also taught uh, at San Francisco State University. Uh, Dr. Igor and holds a, a bachelor's and master's degree from Emory University. There she studied sociology uh, and public health, moved on to do her PhD at the uh, University of California, San Francisco in the area of medical sociology. Um, a lot of really interesting interesting themes and, and, and topics to get into today. We're honored to have her with us. Uh, Dr. Melanie Igor, and thank you so much for taking the time to come on the show today. Thank you so much for having me. This is my first podcast. This is really exciting. Well, let, let's have fun with it. I, I'm looking forward to these topics. Um, love to start off, though, like we typically do, by um, by handing our guest the floor for a little bit to to talk about the early days. You know, I, I was reading all about you prior to to, to doing this show, um, and you know, uh, you know, found out that you are uh, the daughter of a of a really renowned uh, cancer researcher and uh, I was reading stories about how your father uh, Merrill would take you to uh, conferences when, when you were three years old and bring home collaborators and talk about the future of oncology at the dinner table. Um, take us back to the beginning if you would. Tell us a little bit of your background story and how this journey you've been on got started if you would. No, that's that's great. So I am a born and bred sixth generation Baltimorean. Um, so I was born literally across the street, or I guess I was born in a hospital, but I was you know, born across the street from Johns Hopkins Hospital. Um, my favorite family quote on that was actually, that is where my great grandfather had emigrated to when he came to the United States over a hundred years ago. And when my dad got into medical school, he said it was a tough neighborhood in 1917 and it's only gotten tougher. Um, my colleagues at Hopkins may not share that opinion, but I was grew, I learned to walk in a hospital. Um, and so healthcare has always been a place I've been comfortable. My dad did not see a distinction between his work and his work colleagues and our life and our friends, um, which brought me an incredible exposure to healthcare. Um, I didn't realize other people, and I grew up, my parents specifically moved out of Baltimore and moved to a rural community where I was surrounded by a lot of diversity of education, of experience. Um, and my father sort of enriched that, and my mother as well, in the colleagues he brought home. So when he would have international postdocs, they 
came and stayed with us. They became part of our family. So I grew up in this international, in this rural community, but with this international healthcare exposure. Um, and it was really enlightening. I think you are alluding to the story of my dad would have colleagues over for dinner and they would just start writing like on paper, on napkins, on my mother's tablecloth once, to which my mother was not less than happy. Um, but the conversations of health, the conversations of what does it mean to change people's lives? What does it mean that even though he looked at data, it was really people and it was families um, always came through in those conversations. Um, one of the things and one of the things that I think standing here really brought me to where I ended up going with my degree and my work in the healthcare field was my dad used to tell stories of family members that would come be caregivers in hospitals. We've all had that experience. Mm -hmm. And what did it mean to sleep at a family member's bedside and not have a toothbrush with you, not have a razor, not have the things that are small comforts that make you feel human and bring the non-medical side in. Um, so when my dad was on call in the oncology ward, he would carry sort of individual package toothbrushes and razors that he had been collecting at hotels when he would travel so that people could have those small comforts. Yeah. Um, and really he were, and so like that was something that was talked about at our table along with scientific research, along with area under the curve, toxicities, how new drug development happened. Yeah. Um, all of that, you know, and you would, you said, you know, we, my brother and I spent a lot of time going to ASCO and AACR. <laughs> we would walk around. I mean, we always, we didn't know any different. I didn't understand people went to other kinds of vacations than um, going to sit there. And we would hear my dad speak. Like that was part of it was, it wasn't just like, oh, go to a city. It was go be involved in what science means for your family, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which was really interesting. Um, and it also created this great network of people around the world who were all collaborating. Like we talk about the work that NIH does and FDA does. One of the great parts about being where I am now is really hearing those parts of the department talk about their international collaborations and knowing what that means, right? That isn't mm -hmm. just like, oh, it's, no, those people came to Thanksgiving at our family's house because that's a uniquely American experience. So if you are from Australia, you don't understand why the third Thursday in November is off mm -hmm. for everybody else. So instead you come to the chaos that was the Igorin household for Thanksgiving with all of the relatives and a turkey and football. And this is one of my dad's very close colleagues who... um they showed up, I think, November 20th and were like, oh, yeah, we're going to go walk around Baltimore. And we were like, it's Thanksgiving. Everything shut down. Come join us. And to this day, every Thanksgiving, they call to see to like talk to our family on Thanksgiving, even though they're back in Australia and have been now for 40 years. That's wonderful. And that's a wonderful story. Yeah, I, I, my father used to drag me to went to uh, to health insurance conference. All, all I did was collect pens, though. I, I I don't think I got as en enriching experiences. Oh, as if you, you ask did, my but... brother, the highlight was the big yellow flashlight. Like, let's be yeah. real. Like, as little kids, right? The like right. swag was a whole thing. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. That, that, that's all I remember. <laughs> I don't remember what my dad talked about, but yeah. <laughs> no, 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 no. That's a great background story. Um, now you you go on, you know, as, as I mentioned in the intro, um, you you study. Um, uh, sociology, public health, you, you move into this area to do your PhD in medical sociology. And the um, the, the topic of your 2004 dissertation is, uh, is an examination of HIV case management using a behavioral a model for vulnerable populations. And, and um, you know, thinking a little bit, because you know, we had some guests on talking about um, uh, the, the late Dr. Paul Farmer, and uh, he was a, a medical anthropologist, but nonetheless, yep. you know, talked about HIV uh, and, and some of these diseases in sick populations that live in poverty. A uh, little bit of difference between medical sociology and medical anthropology, but kind of a little overlap there. Talk a little bit about your PhD, because we, you know, we, we've also talked about the importance of the HIV case management model and, and how that 
as we've, you know, uh, we've seen the transition of this disease over the decades, a very integral part of that. But talk a little bit about your work, because I think it's important because it merges together, not just that aspect, but the uh, the impact of, of, of labor uh, uh, class, you know, the social issues uh, with how the disease was managed back then. Yeah, and I actually I'm going to start with my pre dissert my first dissertation project, which never became a dissertation, if that's okay with you. Sure. Um, I so I wanted to go study HIV in the late '90s. You went to San Francisco, yeah. right? So I went to UCSF. I got to study with Tom Coates and Molly Cook and all of these Bell Holtzheimer, these great thoughtful people on HIV care. But I wanted to study women. And one of the interesting parts of San Francisco is because a lot of the knowledge base at the time, especially, came out of the LGBTQ community and specifically sort of the activism of gay men in the Castro district. And I started my dissertation research looking at reproductive options for women with HIV. That's where I wanted to go. I wanted to go think about in a scientific field that really had been established based on men's health care needs appropriately so because of the early populations impacted, what happens when you fold in a conversation that is uniquely around reproduction and gender and care and a bunch of other things? So that was great. And I started doing my research. And then the 076 trial, which was putting a, giving AZT to pregnant women, mm -hmm. and pregnant individuals, um, happened. And it dropped vertical transmission to below from like what had been about 25% to single digits. And it transformed how healthcare and those conversations were happening over a really short period of time. Great for patient care, horrible if you want to write a dissertation, because that happened in my, my early establishment. So part of it was a chance for me to stop and say, okay, what is the lived experience of women with HIV, with marginalized populations with HIV that don't fit this paradigm, of, especially in San Francisco um, at the time? And that's a wonderful opportunity when you're a graduate student getting to think big thoughts. Um, it was great that science had changed how healthcare was delivered. But one of the things in those initial days that I saw was a lot of conversations around not understanding women's healthcare experience. I had a preeminent HIV doc say to me, well, the women never show up for their appointments. They don't, they don't. And if, at San Francisco's HIV care at the time was done on you know, at UCSF on the top of the hill in this beautiful building with a great view of the Marin headlands. But it was really hard to get there from the places where especially Black women and lower income individuals lived in San Francisco and even harder to get to from the East Bay. And that conversation that I had with that doctor really changed how I was thinking about healthcare experiences. What was the role of case management, what was the role of care coordination? What was the role of programs that were just being developed like HAPWA, so the right housing for people with AIDS? Oh. What was it, so which people forget exists, but is an incredibly important act towards social determinants of health. What did it mean for understanding caregiving in a different way and exposure and risk? So with that, having to take a pause and go, okay, start over again, learn mm. something new. Um, I really was like, okay, I want to understand the Ryan White program because that is designed to provide these support services. Um, and what does it mean to live in Oakland? And I, you know, Oakland in the late 90s, early 2000s is different than Oakland now. It was the... It was a different. It was a different time for Oakland. It was a different time for California, um, but in particular, it was a population that was isolated from healthcare in a lot of different ways. It was. It had a different community feeling, um, and so I went into Oakland as, and I recognized my privilege. I mean, one guy was like, Hey, white girl, why are you on the bus? And I was like, well, I don't have a car and this is how you get places. But really the, recognizing that distinction and the place where I came into a community um, to ask about their experiences, to ask about was what the federal government was funding through Ryan White, what the state was funding, was that meeting the objectives 
of case management? Was it meeting the community and the patient's objectives for better health care and better health access? Um, and it was, it really allowed me to understand. And one of the best parts of the Ryan White Care Act and one of the programs is it is a federal program, but with a lot of local community engagement. Mm-hmm. Which is a unique, which is unique, right? It is designed to have that federal funds go to the community and the community really makes decisions. The community decides how to impact that. Um, So that is, it's kind of how I ended up where I was on my dissertation. So it wasn't a straight line. I feel like my whole career hasn't been a straight line. And that work isn't done. I mean, I will say that it is very different than where I was 25 years ago. Sure. But where I sit now, listening to the folks at HRSA talk about Ryan White and talk about the importance of those programs and the continuing the shift of the HIV epidemic um, in different populations, Mm -hmm. there are a lot of through lines that still continue 25 years later. Sure. And and, and while we're uh, we're still on the West Coast, then we'll we'll come across to D- to DC but say a couple words if you would uh, along the lines of um what was you're attempting to do with San Francisco state in terms of um improving the medical sociology curriculum to encompass some of these things that in, in terms of the um uh, the various social determinant factors that you said in your PhD, but uh, say say a couple words about that as well, because you, you were trying to um, not, you know, obviously not just do your PhD, but you, you were trying to impact um, you know, how these topics were taught as well. Yeah, um, that's great. And everybody, I mean, let's, medical sociology is one of my, I'm going to sound incredibly biased. I think it's a great place to enter into a sociological conversation, to think about society. Um, especially in the U.S., where everybody has an interaction with the healthcare system. Everybody comes to and utilizes the healthcare system either very elegantly through employer-sponsored coverage that's a really, really lovely plan, or in a super chaotic manner, kind of crashing into an emergency room as an uninsured individual and figuring out what happens next. But everybody's had that interaction. And so understanding the aspects of sociology, that sense of society that's there's there's already an armature for people to hang it on. So I like, as opposed to theoretical things about like Durkheim and Weber and, you know, Parsons, it really is more like, okay, let's look at like what Chuck Bosk says. Let's look at what Adele Clark says about how we deal with technology. How do mm-hmm. you deal with that? Mm-hmm. Um, it's, it so, but part of it was changing that curriculum. And I think, into thinking about, I'm going to use the word that we use now, the intersectionality of yep. race, class, gender, lived experience, healthcare access, because mm-hmm. healthcare is different depending on how you access it, where you access it, and how you pay for it. And then sort of the delivery side and the transformation side, because there is mm-hmm. always sort of iterations and advancement. Um So that, so, but taking that and taking people, and it's a great course to teach because it's sort of a little bit of, okay, here's where you're situated. Here's how you're looking at this. That's your lens of healthcare. Now go stand in somebody else's. Let's talk about what does it mean to be uninsured. Let's talk about what it means to be engaging the system through a Medicaid lens and sort of some of the economics and perspectives that sociology likes to pretend doesn't exist in our in our conversations but very much inform the paradigm of a sociological lens right. um and talk about state players talk about choices like it's just so many different places but you need to come back to that conversation frequently it doesn't it isn't stagnant the course that was taught 10 years ago looks different than the course that's i mean 10 years ago the aca at this point was like a brand new nascent thing. If I was teaching the course now, I think it would look very different than when I taught it 25 years ago, right after the sort of failure of the Clinton healthcare reform attempts. Mm -hmm. Like it was, this is where I get to say it. It's interesting because it keeps changing. 
مشروع So now everything that we just touched on um, from your your childhood to to your experience, you know, working with women with HIV, um, you know, everything we talked about with regard to medical sociology, this all inspires you to to enter into federal service and head over now to the East Coast, uh, to DC. And, you know, you're involved in well, and, and again for for our non- The U.S. listeners and and viewers, um, just let, we'll lay some of this out first. The United States Government Accountability Office—that's sort of our supreme auditing institution of our federal <laughs> government. Uh, you're at GEO, but then also uh, along the way, you become a detailee to the Ways and Means Committee, which, again, for our non-U.S. listeners, this is the Chief Tax Rating Committee of the United States House of Representatives, which figures out how to. raise all the money for these trillion dollar programs. Um, and there you um, are, are initially a staff member, or you're a detailee, then a staff member, then senior staff member. Um, walk us through a little bit of those th those years and, and some of what you were doing then, because that leads into what you're doing now, which basically it touches on everything in, H in the HSS portfolio. But talk, talk a little bit about, say, 2000, I'm, I'm going back a little bit, like, 2012-ish when you were the detailee to all the important stuff that we saw you on C-SPAN <laughs> on the way. How, how do I make it so, here? Yeah. Um, and, 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 and we'll, and we'll touch on HSS after that, but. Okay. So well, this is like? actually where I'm going to, I'm going to start in California and hop here, which okay. is Philly who had been the assistant secretary for health at HHS under both president Carter and president clinic uh, Clinton okay. um, had been a, professor of mine, been a colleague. And at some point he's like, if you really want to understand the federal government, you have to leave the West Coast. You have to go to DC, yeah. go for a year and then go into academia. Mm -hmm. Famous last words. That was 20 years ago. Um, but I came to DC for what I thought was going to be sort of a one year period to understand the federal government, work with and realized I loved it here. I loved the federal government. And what I thought I wanted to do was actually work on Capitol Hill. Um, so I did informational interviews with anybody who would talk to me as I was finishing my dissertation. And everybody said, you are overeducated to be a staff assistant, but you have no mm -hmm. Hill experience, mm -hmm. which is a, thankfully in the past 20 years, a lot more fellowships have developed, the AAAS fellowship, the Winst David A. Winston fellowship. to help the tech fellowships, to help people land. Mm -hmm. But those weren't something that was part of UCSF's academic culture. It wasn't go work in DC. It was go work in academia. Um, I ended up at GAO. It was a great place. So for people that don't know it, as it, it's the Supreme Audit Organization of the United States, but it really is, I always think of it as like the consultants for Congress. They are yeah. asked a question, they are given a year, And what comes out at the end of the year is often a really a deeper background that helps inform congressional staff, but also recommendations to agencies and Congress about how to make programs better. And if you really think about wanting to serve and improve what government does, I mean, I am at my root a sociologist who believes government is here in whatever shape or form to serve the constituencies, to serve the citizenry and the people that live within our borders. Like it's. fundamentally situated there. Mm -hmm. It was also a great chance because I am a lifelong learner. And at GAO, I got to work on all kinds of things. I got to talk about VA and Medicare yep. and my and white program and Medicaid. And it's really actually where I realized that the big payment systems, Medicare and Medicaid, mm -hmm. were things that had the ability to transform how we saw healthcare, but also were just intellectually interesting and had all these like nooks and crannies to dig into. Um So I went to GAO or I went from GAO up to the Hill as a detailee to look at dual eligibles, to look at people that have both Medicare and Medicaid coverage and back to my roots of coordination of care and case management. They often walk around with literally two different insurance cards trying to get care. Medicare pays for some things. Medicaid pays for other things. If you are already at a place where you are part of the most vulnerable populations in the United States. And you're trying to navigate two complex systems because you have two different healthcare cards. Like 
that isn't how we should be delivering health care. And there's an office of dual eligibles now at the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services that was established as part of the ACA. But I went up to the Hill to like help figure out how to better integrate those systems. On day three, I turned to the staff director at the time and said, please don't make me go back to GAO. I love it here. And she said, great, you're here for six months. You have to go back. We don't get to keep detailees. You're really here for this special project. Mm. Um, the universe aligned and I, there was an opening was I was coming to the end of my detail. And so I was sort of on loan for six months to Capitol Hill at the end of that time, there was the ability for me to stay longer. So I became a professional staff member. Um, it was, it is an amazing place to work. As, or as you said, the Committee on Ways and Means is the only committee named in the Constitution of the United States. Mm -hmm. It is a unique place to be. Um, it has an auspicious background and history. It's where all of, if you really think about it, like the funding for what we do as a government has always come from there. So it's a lot about social policy that the tax people will never admit that. Mm -hmm. They will all tell you it's tax policy. Um, and I got to work on a lot of things. And this is maybe what I realized the most there was I could learn anything. If you say yes, I will learn it. If Especially if you are in places where you mean that. People will come to you and help you learn. So I mm -hmm. had incredible experts. I mean, sit down with me and explain the small, mar like I, when I took over the ACA portfolio, what was a small business, like what was a, you know, small market, small business market, what were self-insured, all of the concept of health insurance. Yep. I had like people sit down and just be willing to share this and answer my questions and continue to answer my questions. Um, I fell into the tax portfolio and I love the fact I joke that I'm bilingual. I speak both health and tax because they are very different languages um, because the ACA has a bunch of taxes included in it. And so when I right. took over the ACA portfolio, when I took over the private market coverage, it was the individual mandate, the employer mandate, the health insurance tax, yep. the, my, you know, the high income or the high value health insurance tax, what was used to be referred to as the Cadillac tax. Many of these have um, been repealed, but they were things that talked about big levers and how do you move healthcare decisions um, based on economic policy. Mm -hmm. um, plus, there is something really special about being able to think about new big ideas, which I know the public perception of Congress is it's a bunch of infighting and partisanship and, but the staff that work there, the people that I was lucky enough to call my colleagues for a decade are really curious. They do believe in wanting to work with and work for the American people. I know that people don't feel that. And as a staff member, your goal is to never have anybody know what you do. Like I always told people, my goal was to never have my name in the paper, to never be on TV, to just have it work. Yeah. Then you, But then you end up on C-SPAN and your mother sends you a text. My mother sends me a text. It's like, you should be wearing lipstick. And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> mom, I'm literally trying to get people health. Like 64 million Americans need this improvement in Medicare. And you're like, like a good mom. Yeah. I was like, I'd been up 22 hours at that point. I was just happy I wasn't asleep at the, on, on the house floor. But it's, it is, I I wish, and this is truly, I wish more people understood that commitment of the staff and how expert and smart they are. There are people who have been there for decades. It is not, I know we talk about the revolving door, and pe but there are people that really this serving Congress serving the American people is their life work. And it is it is truly a privilege to say that I did that for a decade and had those people mm -hmm. in my life and as my both thought partners and also sometimes sparring partners. And right. you learn a lot when people challenge you. Right. 
Well, if you were involved in um, in lots of things um, on ways and means, you are really involved in lots of lots of things now with the, the new role at HHS um, as Assistant Secretary for Legislation. And just, again, um, everything, whether Medicare, Medicaid, the U.S. Public Health Service, the FDA, I mean, it all falls under uh, the umbrella and I, and I, you know, I'd love to hear because you know, I your name is not out of your your name is not out of the press. Obviously, we can we, we can research you on the internet and all the cool things you're doing, and like to get into some of these things. And I, I sort of see it in two baskets. Obviously, you know, the the stuff that you, I guess, you know, someone contacts you, and, and, and they like you know, I know a couple months ago you were at the Congressional Black Caucus uh, annual legislative conference talking about PEPFAR, and, and we'll get into that in a little bit. But then there's the other stuff that I, you get subpoenaed. <laughs> Often and you got to go you know, deal with some some senators and Congress people over here and get yelled at and, and beaten on or whatever. But um, talk, talk, just talk about the general role and sort of where the day to day um, sort of part of you comes from um, when you get into the office. You know, after you have your coffee, like you know, who decides what happens in that given day um, and and whether you're off to talk about PEPFAR or ARPA H or any of these uh, trillion of dollar, it? yeah. I mean, what's your typical day like? Talk talk about that first, and then we'll get to some of what you've been doing oh the last couple of months. Oh my gosh, Ira! So there is no typical day. I mean, I think that, and that sounds trite, but the Department of Health and Human Services does everything, as you were alluding to, from Medicaid to LIHEAP to building water and sewer systems on in Indian country as part of the IHS. Like it really does everything, right? Right. And so you never know what's going to show up on the front of the Washington Post or the New York Times or a member of Congress is going to call and say, this constituent is having this problem. This hospital is closing. So there's always the what comes at you. Right. Um, my typical day is I actually get to my desk at about 730 in the morning. Then I get coffee. It's like I have to, like, open my briefcase, take a deep breath. Then I get cool. coffee. Um and I usually spend about an hour and a half just clearing all the administrative things so that at 9 a.m. when things start coming overboard or coming on board, I don't know what um, I can attack them. I can adjust my schedule. But it really is some of what it is is very driven by the secretary. Briefings for him, questions for him, responses that need to be done. Some of it is driven by the White House and policy briefings that they want, policy, you know, information. My favorite call is always, I have this member of Congress who's called, I have a counterpart at the White House. They've called in on a very specific issue. Can we send them to you? Of course, we are here to help. I have a team that really deals with policy, constituent services, grants. So all of the grants that come out of the department, that information flows through us. And then there's always the thing you never expected to be on your bingo card for that day, much less your life, um, that you get to deal with. And sometimes you, I get to work on things that are legacies that have been around for a very, very long time. Yep. The Medicare program has been around for a very long time. It's something I know very well. And I always like when people are like in this and I'm like, oh, I can dig into the file in my brain and pull out that like nugget that I remember yep. or standing up a totally new program. So ARPA H, when I came to HHS, ARPA mm -hmm. H was two lines in the president's budget <laughs> in the in the time that I've been here. And I was confirmed on October 1st, 2021. In that time, we've passed legislation. We have hired an inaugural director. We have launched programs that exceeded my wildest imagination. I mean, Renee Wegerson is amazing and yep. building a partnership with her to make sure that ARPA H challenges a lot of what the Hill expects, right? It is built on a concept of failure. Right. It is built on a concept of you've got to try a lot to find that gem. Um, how do we support that? It's a whole different conversation with Congress right. about taking risks when we think about the goal of a lot of other programs is to mitigate risk and to make sure that every senior in Medicare has access to, new, you know, to 
health care that they need when they need it. It's different than FDA, where, you know, a couple of years ago, we had the infant formula shortage, right? And how do we work with other partners to do that? Um, And then every once in a while, you just get a call and you're like, that really, like, yes, I will help the member of Congress who is stuck in like the Medicare loop of enrollment and how does it fit within their retiree benefits? And you're like, okay, that wasn't the call I was expecting, but I know how to handle that as well. By the way, they get handled the same way everybody else does. You should call (laughs) 1-800-MEDICARE. I don't want anybody to think they get special. Truly, like there is a process for it, but like we get that phone call that says, hi, my boss needs help. I need to know where to send them. Right. Right. Say yeah. I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I appreciate that you brought up the, you know, sort of the comparison between sort of the legacy stuff, which you know, clearly you have to figure out how to keep the the trillions flowing into Medicare, and Medicaid. But then when you when you bring up something like ARPH, I mean, you know, we had Renee on a few months ago and 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 have recently profiled a couple of the ARPH programs, and they are quite fascinating. Again, you know, they you know, pulling from sort of this DARPA concept of you know let's be risky <laughs> and at the same time you know realizing that um when you have a new there's not not infinite money right there's there's a budget <laughs> and um you know the money doesn't fall from the sky uh, any interesting learnings in terms of you know whether it's arpah or uh the cancer moonshot or any of these other uh things that didn't exist last year um in terms of um you know, if because there's a lot of people out there that want moonshots, right? I mean, we need moonshots for a lot of these unmet medical conditions. But any interesting learnings as you've been involved in setting up these these new programs that aren't legacy um, that um, you know are important for us to know about, um, so we can do more of them and, and be successful with them. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the things is right. Even though nothing is nascent, I mean, you said that ARPA H is based on a DARPA model and the other ARPA models across the right. government. It's built on a lot of what we knew and in how, where the failure was in sort of that valley of death, right? You needed that base knowledge. You need to know there was a lot of investment to get to an idea and then you needed to find the market. Um, So I think for any of like the moonshots, the the sprints, the places to be, we should be investing, um, really none of them come out of nowhere. They all have precursors and foundations in our current work. And it's really looking at how to leverage that Mm -hmm. and then launch separately or launch from there. Mm -hmm. Um, I think one of the things that's been interesting to me is watching the NIH and ARPA-H work side by side. Okay. um, Because they do different things. They serve different parts of the development pipeline. Mm -hmm. They have different goals and missions, but the end is the same. How do we improve healthcare? How do we do this in a way that is innovative? How do we do that in a way that is sustainable Mm -hmm. um, and transformative? Mm -hmm. And I actually think one of the things that was interesting to me over the past six months was really going with Dr. Bertinale during her NIH confirmation and hearing her as a clinician. I mean, like going back to where we started this conversation, right? She was an oncologist who like knew my dad. And the first right. thing she ever said to me was like, are you related to Marilee Gorn? And I was like, I'm his kiddo. Mm-hmm. Um, but hearing her take the vision that Francis Collins had really built about a, and Harold Varmus, right? right? Like, what is that science bench based development? And now, how do we pull it into clinical care? Right? How does her leadership as a clinician shift that conversation? And what does that look like in concert with ARPA H and Renee's background yeah. and what ARPA H is doing? But also, how is she having conversations with? And what are the conversations with FDA, right? So like NIH plays a role, FDA plays a role, CDC plays a role. So what are those conversations of the pieces of the department? How are they working? What is that 
I would use the uh, the analogy, like what is that interesting dinner time conversation that's mm-hmm. happening across the parts of the department, right. right? Rather than being siloed, there's really a much more integrated conversation mm-hmm. than I think people realize. Yeah. Um, we saw this with the Alzheimer's drugs and sort of FDA and CMS yeah. play very different roles. Mm-hmm. And it is very important that they play different roles, but they also can exist in silos and not be aware of each other. And I think they've, and then, so like, how do you have that family, that family conversation among the parts of it, HHS? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Moving from um, sort of standing up, uh, new programs uh, and and again uh, the need to have this conversation uh, per the different you know risk profiles and 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 so forth um, to pr- moonshots that clearly worked very well uh, like PEPFAR and as I mentioned you know you participated recently in this this Black Caucus uh, legislative con- conference and you know here we are probably. <laughs> The most successful uh, moonshot they can think of uh, had Ambassador Nakanga Song on back in April talking about the program. And here we are, um, you know, having debates and you, you're, you're at the forefront of it of, you know, should we continue this thing? Yes, it, it, it's worked pretty damn well. Um, what, what's what's uh What's it like? I mean, obviously, with your background, uh, you know, per uh, talking about your PhD, beginning of the show, um, say a few words about you know your involvement with with uh, these types of discussions. Um, again, legacy moonshot, you know, science works. Um, right. I think that's <laughs> it. Is it, PEPFAR is a really interesting program, right? It is right. not just HHS. It is working with other parts of the executive branch and other partners. Um, to talk about it and to really focus on it, I think the hard part for me, and I said this at the panel at the Congressional Black Caucus, um, was I'm going to try. I'm going to. It is. It is. Science has proved. The data have proved. PEPFAR works. Yeah. Yet we are still debating if it works, right. and I. Don't really be right. I mean, you just made the face of like, eh? um, how do we, how do we get beyond that to say this is like you want evidence? We want evidence based care. We want mm-hmm. evidence based programs. We want things that meet the mark or exceed the mark. And then politics come in, and I think where PEPFAR is now is being impacted by conversations that have nothing to do with the efficacy of the program. And it is the first time they've experienced that. I will say it is not unique for other healthcare programs. Um, And just from somebody who wants people to have access to care and wants the U S government to be able to be good partners on the international stage and to be able to make sure we are taking our learnings and sharing them, but also taking learnings from other communities and integrating them into programs. Mm -hmm. Um, There have been hard conversations. And there are also moments where, as the person that's job, whose job it is to work with Congress, translating that back, what are the concerns, right? Sometimes you can keep telling people, and I once worked for an amazing member of Congress who just was like, well, if we just tell them the facts, Melanie, and I'm like, sir, we, yes, but we need, the the facts aren't breaking through. Mm -hmm. And I think that tension right now is hard. What, um, what's coming up for 2024? Um, You know, obviously you have, (laughs) we'll see you on TV and and we'll see, you know, Congress calling you up to talk about this and that Uh, at the same time, I know, you know, you get out there to, to these various conferences on on all the range of topics that HHS oversees, but um, anything you want to highlight as we get uh, further into the year, uh, public facing um, initiatives that we should know about. Uh, clearly, we could we could talk about these topics for for hours, and uh, you know, you have other more important things to do. But anything else on the calendar that that we should know about Melanie while uh, 
uh, you know, you continue on this really unique new role? Um, I mean, I think, I don't know what the year will bring. We're still, we are only six weeks into 2024. And one of the great things about this job, one of the great things about the work that I do is my crystal ball is always really cloudy. And I kind of like it that way because it means... I get to be excited by what I do each day instead of being like, oh my God, I'm saving, solving for the same problem yet again. It's always a new problem. It's always a new challenge. I think the things I am looking forward to in 2024, um, one of which just ended, which was open enrollment for the 10th year for the ACA. We have over 21.3 million people enrolled, which I, given my history is like a very big point of personal pride um, I remember sitting at that first open enrollment in 2020 in 2013 when the website didn't work and staring at my colleagues and being like, what's happening and trying to understand that and really seeing what happens when committed people fix a problem, right? Like it, and this year it's the 10th year and it worked mm-hmm. and it was there during COVID when people lost their job. It was there now as people are, the economy is shifting, as we're looking at more entrepreneurs, as we're looking at people have greater flexibility in their work. So for me, watching that continue to grow, watching the conversations around employer-sponsored or job-connected health insurance and the role of the ACA and the role of lots of other things, um, watching ARPA H continue to grow, Mm -hmm. I think you know, they've just celebrated their first year. What does the next year bring? What does that, as program managers come on, as the program grows, what happens? Um, We haven't talked a lot about behavioral health and mental health, but the work of 988, so it's, we're going into, it's about 18 months since it was implemented. Um, It has transformed, I think, how we talk about mental health and people reaching out. It has been a success that has quietly happened. I wish more people knew about it. Okay. Um, so 988 is the national three-digit number for suicide. It's a suicide lifeline that you can do through text, chat, or calling. So it meets people where they are. It also has um, interpreter services and it's just really designed to meet people at a moment of crisis where those right. calls used to go to 911. And maybe that wasn't the right response. So thinking about that. Um, and how does that lead to better an understanding of sort of our behavioral health work that the Surgeon General is leading? I, I, I'm going to interrupt you. And I apologize because I did I did overlook this in my notes. And if we have a couple minutes, because I, one of the components the, the sam hsa is substance abuse and mental health services administration is another comp- component of of your oversight can, can you talk about that because I, I know recently you've been involved in sort of looking at the budget and, and 988 was in there and i do actually have this in a part of my notes here and i apologize yeah, again for don't bring you we... on. So, talk about this for a bit because i think this is a yeah i mean mental health no doubt is um is a major issue um, on, on all fronts, especially the last couple of years, as you were just mentioning, uh, coming out of the pandemic. But um, say a few words here, because I, I know you've been involved in the, uh, st- you know, the, it talks about the appropriations and all that. Uh, I think less yeah. less people know about SAM HSA, and I'd love for you to talk a little bit about it while you have time. Yeah. If you have time. No, that's great. So SAMHSA is, part, is the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, yeah. um, led by Dr. Miriam Delphin Rittman, who is just... Yeah an amazing powerhouse. Um, But the work they do is really around substance use, mental health, the conversations that people are having at their kitchen table, Mm -hmm. that people are having with their friends. I will say one of the things that we keep talking about is, is mental health, mental health is no longer stigmatized, Mm -hmm. right? Having people say, and looking at the supports that are just available and the conversations that are happening is really important. Um, SAMHSA has, for a long time, it's been supporting communities, um, been supporting individuals, been supporting grantees to make sure that we are meeting people where they are. Um, 
988 is part of is just one part of that. I also think the Surgeon General in his role um, has really shined a light on sort of behavioral health, on the need, the impact of social isolation. What does it yeah. look like coming out? I mean, he was the right Surgeon General to at the right time to talk about these issues and is really, mm-hmm. I think the work he has put forward is been as has really created a conversation and a space for a conversation that I will say probably when I was my kid's age, when I was in high school, wasn't as open, right? We Mm -hmm. didn't talk about this in the same way. There weren't supports in the school systems. There weren't supports um, at universities in the way that there are now. Um, And just listening. So I, I think it's part of a cultural change and a transformation that we are playing a large role in um but the work's not done right i mean we are just at the beginning of this the secretary you know has really led this work on talking about behavioral health mental health physical health or all health and we need to talk about people it's not just like it, it is all part of how we interact with the healthcare system. It's all part of how we as the healthcare system deliver right. for the American people. Um, all right, I, I have two more minutes and then I have to go hop to another meeting. I, 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 I will wrap us up now. Yes, I, I, I know we had a hard stop. I apologize for, That's again, okay. throwing that topic back in there. But no, it, it's uh, it's an amazing journey, Melanie. I, I really wish you the best with all this in this new role and and, and your team there for, for all the important areas that, you, that you're championing for us. Uh, again, for everybody that's listening to this particular episode of our show across the various podcast networks or watching on the YouTube channel, again, you've been spending time with Dr. Melanie Igorin, Assistant Secretary for Legislation, United States Department of Health and Human Services. Uh, Melanie, I want to, again, thank you for taking the time to come on the show, to educate us on everything you've been up to. Obviously, thank you for what you do for all of us here in the United States. And as we say on our show, uh, thanks for helping to create a better tomorrow via what you do. Really a great story. Thank you for letting me join. It's been a great time. Great talking to you.